I'm going to share my desktop in just a moment as well. So let me know when you folks can see my desktop. Yeah. Good? All right, perfect. So don't worry, not death by PowerPoint. Um, I have some slides here. I think they're going to be somewhat helpful for you. Actually, that's not even what I wanted. It's trying to display on my other screen. So. No. All right. So, well, I'm just going to basically keep PowerPoint open like this then. How about that? Sometimes Windows doesn't want to uh, cooperate with me here. Don't say All right. So, thank you for having me. My name is David Voiles. Uh, I was a technical evangelist at Microsoft, hence the old title up here. Uh, now I essentially work as a software engineer. Um, I don't do as much with gaming as I used to do. Uh, now I kind of more focus on um, a variety of areas. I'm on a team called CSE, that's Commercial Software Engineering. And the idea is that uh, my team is entirely remote. We work across the world and typically with some of the larger partners in the world. So now I do things with um, accounting firms, which may not sound very interesting, but I assure you on the data science and machine learning side it is. And then other times, awesome projects around um, animation, gaming, and technology come in. And right now I'm doing something with uh, Fox Studios in California, uh, specifically on uh, the Kingsman. So my job is all over the place. Uh, but previously I worked quite a bit with video games. I got my start uh, originally on my own, kind of making uh, indie games on Xbox 360. I worked at Comcast, uh, the large ISP and cable company, where I built out their Xbox 360, Xbox One, and dabbled on their PlayStation application. Uh, and at this point, I've uh, had a tons of experience with both Xbox, HoloLens, uh, Nintendo. I've actually got my Switch right here. I'm playing a ton of Final Fantasy VII on as of late. I'd recommend that to anyone who likes RPGs as well. But with that in mind, let's get started on how to develop games for consoles and kind of get your foot in the door as an indie as a whole. How does that sound? Good? Uh, actually, I should have shared this slide before, but um, <laughs> now I'm looking at it. Uh, so I also wrote some books. I worked with uh, on the Unreal Engine, wrote a book on that, did a ton with Unity. We partnered with Unity quite a bit in the last few years where we'll kind of do road shows. And that is we will essentially teach developers how to create applications on Unity and deploy them uh, across the world. Uh, so, you know, kind of ignore the title as a whole right here. The gist that I want you to take away from this is here are some of the key things you need to know to um, create games, especially as an independent developer. Not necessarily just for consoles, but really get your, your job out there. Um, and I'll leave maybe the last 10 minutes or so uh, as a time to talk uh, so that we can kind of answer some of your questions. And finally, I gave uh, a very similar talk to this where I had a little bit more time uh, in Berlin, at uh, Berlin, Belgium, <laughs> uh, about six weeks ago. And I post that on my blog, which I'll have a link to as well. So you can kind of get more details about some of this information too. Uh, so particularly, with consoles uh, in 2019, um, they're still somewhat closed, but far, far more open than they used to be. I mean, if you were trying to write a video game in, uh, you know, we'll say the 1990s, uh, it was an absolute project. There were very, very few developers or studios creating content, and almost all of it was in assembly. Um, even on PlayStation 1, most of the video games were programmed in assembly. Uh, and then some C kind of scattered here and there. Today, obviously far, far easier with fantastic tools like Unity and Unreal Engine or uh, Mono Game if you want to use C Sharp. But essentially, they're all going to require a lot of the same things, right? The consoles demand quality over quantity today. Um, so to prove you're serious, you need a handful of things. You're going to have to be a registered company or sole proprietor. Um, this can be something like an LLC. Uh, which is a limited liability corporation, or it could be what's called a sole proprietor, where you are the uh, single um, you know, leader of this foundation or company. I'm not going to bog it down with the business sides, but a lot of these things you can create you know, very locally by just you know, going to City Hall and paying $100 and kind of getting yourself off the ground. Um, having a track record. So when I say track record, it doesn't necessarily mean that you must have worked for a AAA studio at some point. Essentially what a lot of the uh, console manufacturers are looking for is to simply see that you've made something, right? That you can go from beginning to end. Uh, and that's fine if you've released something on mobile or a web version of your game, or maybe you have like just a very active developer blog. That's fine. Uh, this isn't a requirement, but it's really you illustrating that, hey, I'm more than just 
a simple hobbyist who wants, you know, a free console um, and, you know, Xbox or PlayStation attached to my name. And then finally, where it says VAT or value added tax number, that's largely if you are creating or releasing in the European regions. Not too concerned with us right here. Uh, track record kind of dived into a little bit of this before, so I'm not going to go too crazy here. Um, another one that comes up pretty often is the parity clause, right? The idea is that uh, both Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo expect simultaneous releases across all consoles. And the idea is um, that they really want like an even playground, we'll say. So there are things like timed exclusivity, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but for the most part, what they're trying to say is, you know, what makes your title stand out on their platform? What kind of features are you really working with right there? Um, other things along the way, expensive items. I highlight this one simply because I think it catches a lot of people off guard. Things like errors and emissions insurance. Right, so this covers both your IP copyright violations um, and even insurance. So when I say insurance, you're probably thinking like, why would I need insurance if I'm making a video game? Well, today, imagine that someone um, has a condition like epilepsy, right? Where they have, if, as soon as they see a bright light, uh, they could potentially have a seizure. Uh, for an event like PAX or GDC, if you're showing off your game, they have those hard floors around you. Um, and suddenly they're playing it and bright lights or flashes go off and you don't have perhaps an epilepsy warning prior to your game launching or some kind of insurance to protect you, well, you're liable for it. Same thing if you're playing games at home. That's just one small example. Uh, ratings boards, right? So we have what's called the ESRB here in the States, uh, Electronics Software Rating Board, I believe it's called. Um, it's actually a really interesting story behind how that got started. Um, it was in the era of Night Trap, Mortal Kombat, and Doom. So if you can picture around 1993, um, really Nintendo uh, and Sega were kind of going back and forth. They, they um, were really duking it out during the Attitude era, right? Sonic and Mario and all these things. And what happened was they went uh, in front of the US government and said, you know, uh, actually the government brought them and said, hey, there's quite a bit of violence in some of your games. Right, they looked at Doom as though it was this disgusting thing. And we look at Doom today and like, you know, it's pretty pixelated, right? Um, but back then, it wasn't quite seen the same way. So what the government said was, okay, software industry, either you can self-regulate and do a good job of it, or we'll do the regulation for you. And what the software manufacturers, particularly on games, decided to do was say, hey, you know what? We have this on our own, we'll take care of it. And that's how the ESRB came about. Uh, there are other uh, ratings platforms on um, different in different countries. For example, Peggy, you might hear, so Pan-European Game Information. I believe Japan has their own as well. So these are small costs that you're gonna have to pay along the way to kind of get your game out the door to these different platforms. Uh, there's a bit more here. Again, I'm trying to wisely do this because I don't want to go too depth or too far with this. And I also want to discuss you know, the benefits of community and things of that nature. Uh, startup costs, you're gonna have quite a bit as well, right? Software, Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, uh, even some of the engine licenses you're gonna have to pay for. Um, although I found that a lot of the engine manufacturers are doing a great job of trying to bring the cost as low as possible, particularly something like um, Epic Games with their store that just launched in the last few months. Right, they have a great um, profit sharing program. And I believe if you launch in their store right now while using their engine, uh, that there's either no cost or it's maybe 5% cost associated with it. Um, and at the same time, it's kind of giving Steam a run for its money. Obviously, you're gonna need some hardware, maybe some video capture uh, tools, and then even professional services. You know, people might laugh at this, like a bookkeeper or a lawyer. Uh, a lawyer may not go after right away, but something like a bookkeeper, I think absolutely is going to help you out. Um, perhaps you have someone on retainer or who helps you every quarter just to do something as simple as taxes or keep track of expenses. This will help you out quite a bit along the way. Uh, and you might think, oh, well, I'm just a student, right? This isn't gonna be practical for me, but it absolutely is. Imagine you have uh, you know, your LLC, your sole proprietorship, and you're um, renting out your apartment. Well, if you make your game inside your apartment, you can actually declare part of that rent as a business expense, and you can write that off. doesn't mean it's free. It simply means that it's tax deductible. Same thing with hardware. If you have to buy you know, um, another laptop or something, or you need more screens or hardware, 
same thing. That's a business expense. So not free, but uh, you're essentially reducing your tax cost for a lot of these things. Um, so that can be very helpful for you. Uh, council development environment, right? So somewhat different from a PC. Um, a lot of these tools you don't receive until you actually sign up for their programs. For Xbox, it would be ID at Xbox. Uh, PlayStation has their their own tool set um, and a program. I think I have it highlighted later on here. But essentially what's going to happen is you're going to get an SDK, software development kit, um, from each company installed on your machine. So you can start writing or porting over your application to their consoles. Uh, they'll also give you a dev kit. I know that ID at Xbox does the same thing with Sony and Nintendo. And dev kit today really looks similar to um, the piece of hardware that you get from a retail store. When I was working at Comcast, our Xbox 360 was looked just like a normal 360. But it had a thing called a sidecar attached to it. Let me see if I can find one of these real quick. So Xbox 360 sidecar. Yeah, it looked something like one of these images. Here we go. Let's see if this one popped now. There we go. So this is what it looked like, right? These are the Xbox 360 consoles. The sidecars, this large device on the top here. And for a while, that was the 360 development kit, where you had uh, a very similar looking 360 to what would normally be released. But this would have things like uh, additional RAM for you know you to have a debugger attached to. Uh, it would also allow you to run unsigned code. That is code that Microsoft did not check, but you're essentially saying, no, I trust it, and I want it to run on this device. Uh, these sidecars cost, when it first came out, $20,000 a piece for each one of these little blocks. So you can imagine, uh, even at a place like Comcast, I had six of those on my desk. That's you know $100,000 plus. Today, uh, I've got another uh, Xbox on my desk here. It's a dev kit, and it is looks and behaves identical to what you have today You know, if you went to Walmart. I went to go buy one. So again, the costs have come down significantly, uh, as well as the, the tools available for you. I find that Visual Studio, if you're a programmer, uh, is almost certainly going to be the tool of choice for just about everyone. And uh, particularly with something like Xbox or Sony, I know that Sony even has their debugger, a little add-on that um, uh, you can attach to Visual Studio to really write PlayStation code for it. Um, Visual Studio is free today, you know, so you can download even the Community Edition. I work at Microsoft, and that's still what I use is you know the free version it works perfectly fine, um, and get a lot of your tools going that way. So kind of went over some of the startup costs, console development environments. Um, again, in terms of the actual engines and tools, uh, C and C++ works on every console, although it's far less, uh, we'll say, popular today. Uh, for making games than it was in prior years. And that's largely because we have tools like Unity, C Sharp, or Unreal, C++, which do tons of the heavy lifting for you. Um, I would say if you want to have a blast working on low level, C, C++, fantastic. But if realistically you want to get something out the door and as many platforms as possible, Unity and Unreal are probably your best bet at this point. So I, I can see you folks. How many of you are using Unity or Unreal right now or in the very recent past? Perfect. Most people. That's about what I expected uh, as well. So again, I, I encourage you to use both of those. C and C++, fantastic. I love writing in it, but it's a bit of a project to get your game to work on every platform that way. Um, also, uh, you can barter for what you need. Right? So if you're making a game and you want to get it on one of the major platforms, uh, you have a bit of control as well. Right? So things like timing. Uh, when in the year do you want your game to launch? Uh, when you uh, go to release your game on or talk with the console manufacturers about getting your game on their platform, this is one of the questions they're going to ask. So you can work with them to understand when would be a key date to launch some of these titles. Uh, I would tell you something like November, December, probably a terrible time, simply because that is like the hype of uh, the hype cycle for video games, where you're launching against the biggest of the biggest, right? The triple A's, the Call of Duties of the world. So maybe you want to release something around maybe this time when things really start to slow down a bit. Exclusivity and length, right? How long do you want this uh, this game to be just on this platform? Uh, oftentimes, for something like uh, Cuphead, right? Big title, 
uh, from an independent developer. It was released on 360 and PC first, and they said with Microsoft, hey, we'll have it on your platform for you know at least one year before we go elsewhere. Uh, and now I see it's coming to the Switch. So this might be something you want to negotiate too. And finally, marketing and funding. Right? If you are making some great use of a new tool or something that the company is trying to highlight, uh, this might get you the opportunity to have more exposure. So, for example, are you familiar with things like Twitch or Microsoft has Mixer, right? very similar, it's a video streaming platform. What you might say is, well, actually, I have a great Mixer integration or functionality with my game. Here's how I think it's different from the rest of the titles out there. And someone like Microsoft might say, hey, we are looking for some game or title to you know, highlight how great this platform can be. So this is great. Either we'll give you a larger cut or a better business deal, something of that nature. So you have quite a bit to negotiate with as well. How does that sound so far? Good? Perfect. All right. Um, some of these more technical parts I'm not going to go too far into just yet. Maybe I'll cover ID at Xbox for a moment. ID at Xbox, again, is our independent developer program. Um, when it first started, it was somewhat small and a bit more exclusive. But now, you know, it's open to anybody and everybody. So I encourage you all to at least get more information there. Xbox.com slash developers slash ID. Very friendly folks. There are places like GDC and PAX. You can just go right up and speak to them there as well. Um, Sony has a similar program, uh, as does Nintendo, which is really starting to open up their doors too. Uh, some of these other parts I'm going to skip past. Here we go. PlayStation. They have what's called the Pub Fund. So uh, even though I work at Microsoft, I still play tons of video games. I'm going to tell you, if I was in your spot, I would release on every platform possible. I would go talk to all the console manufacturers, see what kind of deals they're going to give you, uh, understand which titles are coming out. Uh, there's, I think sometimes people think there's like this big heated rivalry between uh, the console manufacturers and you know in some ways i'm sure there is but realistically uh you know most people working in games work in that that area because they absolutely love it right so we're going to play uh, and really support every console manufacturer so the pub fund is one way you can work very closely with playstation and that uh, means that sony doesn't own your ip rights but you potentially have an advance in sales or royalties for your title. That is money up front in exchange for, we'll say, limited platform exclusivity. So what happens is uh, Sony may get um, a larger percentage of each sale, right? Instead of maybe 30%, which seems to be pretty standard and typical these days of each sale, they might say, hey, we're going to get 45%, so they get a larger chunk, but they might give you thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on day one to say, hey, here's why you should release on our platform right away. So it's that little trade-off of, do you need the money now? If so, you know, you might go that route. Uh, Sony also requires what's called a static IP. Um, and that means it's an IP address from your local internet service provider, in my case Comcast, that does not change. The reason they have this requirement is so that they know when they send you that dev kit, and their dev kit looks a bit different, it's like a, a large box essentially, um, that when they give you this dev kit that you are not going to sell it or use it elsewhere because that dev kit will be tied to your account and your account is tied to the static IP. Um, and again, that's to kind of prevent it from going on eBay at some point in the near future. A response time from Sony seems to be you know, very fast, one to two weeks, which is great. And they do a lot of dev kits you know, pretty easily. So I'd encourage you to go look at No Hurdles, Just Games. That's actually their website. So let's go see. No Hurdles. There we go. Obviously, I've been there several times before. And boom, here you go. You can join PlayStation Partners and kind of get your game off the ground. How's that sound so far? Good? All right. Nintendo. Uh, like I said before, Nintendo is uh, a bit of an odd bird in this regard. It's taken them some time to like really support smaller or independent developers, but they've done a great job as of late. In fact, I just returned to from PAX East in Boston. Have any of you been there before? Oh, it's so fun. It's um, a game conference, not so much for game developers, we'll say, but more for enthusiasts or people who love pa uh, video games. So I went... And the theme of this show for me this year, at least, was everything is coming out on Switch. 
Um, I travel a lot. I'm flying all over the place for work. And I realized I finally need to pull the trigger and get a switch for myself for flights because all these games, AAA to smaller independent games, were coming out in this device. So typically in the past, Nintendo has been, we'll say, very much a proponent for uh, first party titles. That is, games made for and by Nintendo on their own platforms. And then everyone else was kind of the little guys that they occasionally let in. I mean, this goes back even to the early 80s. Uh, an example of you know, one of the first times they really started to loosen things up was probably around the time the Argonaut software came out with Star Fox in 1993 or 94. Uh, there was a British developer who then had to go to Japan to work with Nintendo to make Star Fox. Um, so Nintendo owned the IP, but the tech in the game itself was created by um, a small British startup. Uh, nowadays, Nintendo seems to be you know, a bit more open with things. So you can apply for their self-publishing program at developer.nintendo.com. And um, they want to really start focusing on Switch and 3DS. Um, I'd say Switch is probably your better bet if you're targeting a game largely featured for um, a worldwide audience. Where 3DS, although it's very popular in the States, it's extremely popular in Japan. It is so popular, in fact, that when they started releasing uh, newer models, they didn't even launch with a, a, a charger because they knew that all the people they were selling this to already owned a 3DS, right? So maybe you wanted 3DS XL, the larger version, or the newer, smaller version. It did not come with a charger because people were essentially buying two, just getting rid of their old one and using the old charger for the new device. Um, so this 3DS, extremely popular um, overseas. And then you can get a refurbished dev kit. I don't think that Nintendo... Um, will give you more than one dev kit at a time unless you buy others. Um, and you can essentially get them loaned for about $800 a year. Now, 800 might sound like a lot up front, but if you're confident in your title and you plan on making you know, quite a bit of money, then $800 in the grand scheme of things may not be so bad. Community, here is the fun part. I kind of highlight the Chicago game development community on this particular slide. That's largely because uh, a coworker and I, Sarah Sexton, she was in Chicago at the time, uh, living there for work, and um, we had this uh, talk together. So uh, she particularly highlights things like Indie City Games, the Chicago Unity Meetup, things of that nature. So I'm sure there may not be as many in your particular area, although you are at a massive university, but when you start going um, to some of the more major cities, um, even if you have to travel you know, for a brief period of time, I would encourage you to go take a look at some of the meetups in your area. So I'll actually show you right here. Have you seen meetup.com before? All right, we will see. So meetup uh, is essentially a free site that you can sign up for. It sounds like dating or something, but I assure you it's nothing like that. Instead, it's more for really finding popular events nearby. So you can create an account, and then you kind of add a bunch of uh, interests that you have. I mean, this site has interest for everything, whether you like snowboarding or boxing or video games or board games, there's something for everyone. So what you can do is um, type in your area. So in my case, I'm gonna move this over. Uh, let me see if I can log in. It has been some time for me, so we'll see. But when I was doing, there we go. Much more with the community, it was very easy for me to find what was happening. So you see right here, Saturday, April 13th, uh, one community that I was already involved in was Philly Code Camp. Actually, as soon as I get out of here, I'm driving over to my office right outside of Philadelphia. Where I'm giving another talk on machine learning and data science. Uh, so that's what this Code Camp is. But you can see here's some other groups that I'm part of, like a hiking group, uh, fun in Philadelphia, food. Again, it's lots of food and, and things of this nature, but if I looked for maybe game development within 50 miles of my area, Let's see if it pops up. Here we go. Indie Hall, co-working in Philly. Uh, we have the Philly Game Mechanics Game Jam Showcase, right? So there's more things of this nature. And this is just in the next few weeks. Uh, Tech Philly Dev Conference at Drexel University. So um, you can find all kinds of meetups and user groups this way. I think this is a fantastic way to get involved. And that is to not only see what everyone else is doing, but also maybe recruit other people. If you have play testers, you can get involved with what other people are doing. And you can also highlight your titles as well. Um, so I used to be much more involved with communities with my prior job at Microsoft. 
uh, and I absolutely loved this. This was a blast. So I encourage you to look at things like Meetup, and particularly if you're going to go visit other cities for some of your game development. Uh, we have also some other presentations here. Uh, these are from GDC 2017. Obviously, we just passed GDC 2019 this year. It was about three weeks ago. All of those talks will be online in the very near future, typically uh, on YouTube. Um, but with that in mind, let me close this out. And let me see how much time we have. It is... Okay, 12 o'clock. So you have some more time. Perfect. Because I want to show you are some resources that are available for you. So knowing what I know today, if I'm a game developer trying to get started with making games, I am going to head to a handful of these sites. I'm going to go look at something like Gama Sutra. Have you seen this before? Yes? All right. Gama Sutra, the art and business of making games. This place is fantastic. I check this out all the time, largely because I want to see what is happening on the, the business side of the game development world. Um, they'll also allow you the opportunity to write articles. Uh, I wrote several long form pieces a while ago on, on marketing for independent game developers. Uh, and they used to have a game developer magazine uh, that was published in. And it was fantastic for exposure because these folks work very closely with the folks at GDC, the game developer conference. So you can get a lot of overlap and really hit a great audience. And you can see just on the news today, um, our video, Practical Advice for Saving Video Game History Before It's Too Late. And we have Mega Man 7, 8. This is a PlayStation 1 title here. Uh, also, you know, something with an Xbox executive kind of talking about game streaming. So I go, go here to kind of get a feel for what's happening in the industry. Uh, is there anything that I really need to be aware of? Uh, and again, you can write articles here and kind of get some of your own work out. And in the case, you see things like tough questions to improve your leadership motivate player for better engagement uh, and retention. Um, so you can write, you know, essentially create your own blog here and share information. I was doing this for quite a while too. I think this is a great way to get your work out the door. Um, before you saw, I was kind of hovering over DaveOils.com. Shameless self-promotion, but I, I mean this is the truth. This thing will get you so much work and exposure. It might take you some time to make a blog, but and I swear to you, this thing has brought so much work to me and it's allowed me to showcase things that I've been doing in the past. You don't even have to be a web developer to make a website. You know, there are places like WordPress. In fact, this is a WordPress website. So you could go to wordpress.com. Uh, and obviously there's other tools and, and resources. I'm just simply using WordPress for 10 years and it works very well. So you can start for free or even on these smaller sites. Um, to pay like you know three dollars a month or five dollars a month for your blog again you don't have to code at all a lot of it's drag and drop but this thing is a lifesaver um, largely because uh, you don't have to code but at the same time you can kind of build your own resume have some about me maybe if you do a podcast that's another great way to get work out there i did podcasts for years both at a site called armless octopus see if we still have this up. No, I guess we took it down. It's been a while. Armless Octopus. So this was a uh, game development blog that myself and several friends had put together uh, almost 10 years ago at this point. Just as a way to kind of get our foot in the door um, with gaming. Some of the stuff, I don't know what this is. Uh, these are not our drawings, but this was ours. Armless Octopus. And we just covered Xbox Live Indie Games. So we found a little niche and we went after it. And then because we were making videos and having a podcast and reviewing people's games, it granted us the opportunity to go to places like GDC or PAX as press um, and kind of make more connections out there. Um, so this might be a great way to kind of get your, your work out. Like, you know, here was us kind of showcasing here the best indie games of 2011. I can't believe it was that long ago. Crazy. But... Um, uh, that's you know a very affordable and easy way to get your work out there. We also had a podcast. We had about 120 episodes over about five years, and we just interview people, get them on board. Here is another podcast that I have. It is actually called the Indie Dev Podcast. Uh, I haven't done an episode in about a year simply because uh, I got burnt out. I just had too much work going on. But what I wanted to go do is kind of share the work of all these other folks who I had met while working in the industry. Uh, people who worked on audio or maybe they're releasing on different platforms. Maybe they worked at Unity or Unreal. 
Um, a lot of my coworkers, like here's a Cuphead shirt. Uh, Alicia works at Unity. Sarah, she put the slide together with me. She now works on HoloLens. Um, so what I wanted to do is just kind of share the stories of people who are working in the industry. Again, dvpodcast.com and a link to this um, on this blog post too. I just want to see, you know, what are people doing? How can I highlight their work? And uh, I'll tell you, this was extremely pivotal in not only sharing my work, but also you know, making friends in the industry for quite a while. Um, going back again, again, this WordPress blog, uh, you can do things like stream on Twitch, and then as I'm streaming, people, if they happen to come here, they could see in real time, am I streaming? All of my tweets would appear right here. But most importantly, and the key part is that you are updating this with your work from time to time, because this is signaling to the world here is who I am, or at least what I'm trying to strive for. And if they see over and over, okay, this person, you know, if you saw a couple of years ago, it was all video games for me. In the last couple of years, it's been machine learning, Docker, uh, and AI. What I would do is I would you know, give a talk, like this is my talk in Belgium uh, in March. I might give a talk, uh, I might have a photo from the talk, and I would link to the video as well as the slides. Again, this is a very similar slide deck to the one we had used today. And then now people can kind of go back and take note of what uh, you're doing. So if I'm a developer, I would go back and I would um, definitely talk about my work. So one final example. Um, even if you don't know where to go or what to start with or how to make a game, I had no clue several years ago, so I would just make a developer diary, right? I would just literally write as I was going along and say, hey, here uh, is me trying to figure out how to do something. I have no clue. I love Mega Man, so I tried to make a Pong game in C Sharp with Mega Man. So here's a dumb prototype just to see if it worked. And then once I got the gist of that, kind of went to the next level and I started to uh, you know, work on Unreal Engine, at least the previous version from what we have today, and do some 3D modeling, some texturing, and re essentially try to recreate one stage from Mega Man 2 inside of the engine and uh, kind of have different debugging features in here. And the final piece, you know, once you're, people are starting to get an audience here, they're starting to respond to some of what you're doing, uh, you want to just keep a log. And that's exactly what I did here. Some parts, you know, not necessarily embarrassing. Uh, some people might say, oh, well, I'm hesitant to share what I'm working on because I look like such an amateur or I'm so new. That's completely understandable. But at the same time, if I'm an employer and I'm going to look to hire somebody, I want to see your earlier work and then where you are today because it shows how you can progress over time. So if someone was to look at this, they'd say, ah, this guy is definitely a beginner, right? And this is from January 30th, 2012. But if you look at the work I'm doing today, you can see, oh, wow, you came from this and here was your progression along the way. Okay, if this person can figure out these things and here's their thought process, I'm confident they can learn these other skills as well. You with me so far? Perfect. All right. So I'd say make a blog, get a free one, um, and just talk about what you're doing. And then once you start to get your foot in the door, perhaps create a podcast or ask people questions and share that knowledge with the world uh, because that's how you're growing your brand, their brand. You're kind of making friends along the way. So with that in mind, it is 12 8, we have about 12 minutes. Um, the last thing I want to discuss before I want to open up for questions would be, say, the Game Developer Conference. So this was the first big event that I went to about 10 years ago, and I've been going every year since, although on occasion I've missed out from, uh, too much traveling for my own work now. But this is the annual Game Developer Conference held in San Francisco around March each year. Uh, so if you want to get involved in games, this is the place to be. Um, and it's such a mixed bag. There are people who have years of experience through working in AAA. Uh, Nintendo's there, Microsoft, Sony, um, all the big developers. And at the same time, there are smaller developers showcasing what they're doing in the expo hall. There are people looking to recruit and hire people. There are portfolio reviews. Um, there's also people who are just getting started in the industry. And some of my best friends today are people who I had met there 10 years ago. In fact, I just went to Boston for PAX, another game conference. All the people I stayed with there were people I met during my first GDC 10 years ago. So it's kind of like you're going together as a group or a pack, staying in touch and just really working together to share each other's work. Um, the hotels can be very expensive simply because of San Francisco, 
but there are ways of getting a free or affordable pass, particularly if you're a student or you want to be a volunteer. But I would say if you really want to get started in games, GDC would be the best place to go, if not only to learn, then to network and everything else. Uh, so with that in mind, we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanted to open up the floor to you to ask any questions that you might have along the way. Uh, yes, sir. I see a gentleman raising his hand, the black shirt. Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so Dave, I just have a quick question. Uh, what would you say the best way to track the market for uh, indie games is? Like, how can I see like sales figures and like what's like popular and trending right now? Ah, uh, okay. What is trending right now for games? I would say uh, Steam Spy. I think he might be down now. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, it still works. It looks like so. Steam Spy is fantastic. Uh, so. <laughs> Steam, it's difficult to get like an absolute understanding of um, the numbers because Valve or Mix Steam doesn't share everything. But Steam Spy has been a fantastic tool um, that someone had created to kind of track what's been released and how it's doing. So, for example, we look at Risk of Rain. To, how about this? Uh, Sekiro, right? So, this is from, from software, uh, oddly enough. And it's kind of like uh, Dark Souls, these very difficult games. So we can see user score, 90%, looks pretty awesome. Uh, on Steam, at least, it shows there's guessing between 0 and 20,000 in sales, uh, which for this kind of game probably sounds about right. Devil May Cry 5, it shows 200,000 to 500,000. Uh, that might be correct as well. I would say Steam Spy is great, largely because it's all about data mining. And apparently, he's got uh, Medium articles now, which I haven't seen in a while. But yeah, Steam Spy uh, might be great. Although it looks like at some point Valve was trying to take him down. But yeah, I, I would look there or maybe VG Charts. Let's see if this one still works. Yeah, VG Charts would be the other one. And they're going to give you tons and tons of analytical data to understand, you know, global hardware totals. Um, what are, yeah, here we go. Platform chart for just this month alone. Yeah, so those two I'd say are absolutely key for keeping your thumb on the pulse. Should we have any other questions for folks in the room? Yes, it's someone with a watch on their left-hand side. Sorry, off screen here. Um, when you were talking about Sony's pub fund, I was kind of reminded of uh, Hello Games and No Man's Sky's launch. Yes. I was wondering if like, getting um, revenue from a giant company like that kind of puts undue pressure on an independent studio. Um, sure. They didn't have a successful. Oh, they didn't have a very like, smooth launch, I guess. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. For those who don't know, Snowman Man's Sky came out what two, maybe three years ago, in August twenty sixteen. Um, so it was like touted as this new big, great, huge thing that's coming out on PlayStation Four. It was going to have you know a hundred million worlds to explore. Uh, and actually, I will show you. <laughs> YouTube, No Man's Sky, Jurassic Park. I don't know if you can hear this audio. Let me know. Can you hear this at all or no? No. Uh, okay, imagine the Jurassic Park music playing. And this is what comes out. These like dumb looking dinosaurs where they just dilapidated, the worlds don't look fine. So this game was, it was uh, managed by the pub fund, and the idea was, you know, they got some money up front, Sony kept touting this and highlighting it, but also, it definitely put undue pressure on the developers, they kind of fell from a lot of this pressure, and essentially what happened was they kept making more and more and more promises, and it was supposed to be this massive thing, and when it came out, it was mm, nothing. It, it was, just didn't see the success that they had kind of hoped for simply because I think, to your point, they had too much pressure. So was your question more about, um, do you think that it, it, it gives undue pressure by accepting the money up front? I mean, yeah, kind of like, or if there's, or if you have advice for like, navigating that, should that happen? Yeah, I think it definitely can uh, give you some kind of pressure up front where you're thinking, okay, we have this money, so there's a lot of expectations. At the same time, uh, games, I'll say, are very, very risky investment because for every you know game that takes off and does really well, there are thousands that just do not go anywhere at all. So I would not um, 
bet my future on a particular game or release simply because you can have something that's actually a great game, but maybe it's just the wrong time or the wrong market. Or you look at PUBG, right? Um, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. The game was huge when it came out. Now it's got a six out of ten on Steam. Banned in Nepal. Like they just took off like wildfire because something else came out along the way. Fortnite, right? No, oh, I can't spell. Fortnite, which just took the world by storm. And in fact, something like Fortnite, um, Epic actually had another game. This is probably the most popular game in the world at this point. Um, they had another game called Paragon. It was like a, a MOBA that I played for a while. So Epic was making both of them at the same time. Fortnite was actually a completely different game uh, for about the first year of development. PUBG came out, and then what happened was they said, whoa, this thing took off like wildfire. We should make Fortnite more like that. And then within about two months, they forked forked Fortnite, went in that Battle Royale direction, and that game just took off like Epic had never expected before. So for that reason, I would say, yes, there's always pressure to create a game. I would not bet the farm on anything simply because what gamers want right now or this year will be completely different from what they want one year from now. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Do you have any other questions there, or is this a very shy audience? I don't see any answers. Just ask another one. Sure. Do you think uh, Do you think there will still be a market for like retro style, like uh, 2D side scroller type games in the future? Do you think that's like uh, not the market? Oh no, I think there is, and will always be a market for something like that. There is um, Bloodstain. So Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. This was uh, 9 out of 10 on Steam, right? Which is unheard of. <laughs> uh, this is a 2D retro game from a lot of the folks who made Castlevania and those types of games uh, in the 90s. This is like a spin-off game that they made in anticipation of a uh, 3D style game they have coming out later this year. This game, rave reviews. This was their little side project. Uh, it sold like wildfire. The, the real game that they were making so I should say, this is kind of like a little teaser to their 3D version of the game. The 3D version just had a demo, and people were like, no, stop, stop, go back to this. Um, so if, if that's one example, and I'll tell you just by going to, again, past the Penny Arcade Expo last month, it's just so many 2D side-scrolling games, particularly with this kind of art style. And then even look at things like um, Game Hut Kickstarter. Game Hut, uh, if you want to learn how video games were made in the 90s, I would in highly encourage you to take a look at Game Hut on YouTube because uh, that developer shows exactly how he wrote these games in assembly, but he just started a little Kickstarter. Um, yeah, just started a little Kickstarter, we should get it here, about streaming 2D games, particularly these old retro games. Here it is. It's interesting, your question, because Game Hut, huge on 2D, these old games, massive fan base. You know, it's got 112,000 followers just in that one year of him making short, simple videos on how you make simple 2D games. Had a Kickstarter the other day, and people just kind of trashed it. And the idea of this Kickstarter was retro games, which everyone loves, but streaming. Streaming is the new hotness, right? You see Google just announced... Um, uh, I don't know, I'm drawing a blank. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Google Games Streaming. Stadia. Okay, so streaming is like the new hotness. People have been trying to stream forever. <laughs> I'll give my thoughts on that in a minute. But so anyway, I'll say it. As soon as people saw this, they said, man, the comments were brutal in his YouTube. Oh, I love what you do. We love, you know, 2D games. We want to buy them and hang on to them and hold them. But we don't like the idea of streaming. So for that reason, you know, again, very timely. I think 2D, probably not going away. Often much more cost effective than making 3D and you can get things out the door faster. But the catch is you've got to do it the right way because something like streaming, even if you have a license for all these games, I don't think will take off. And particularly something with like Stadia uh, with Google. I'll be honest. So the idea with Stadia is Google has a platform where the games are running on a remote server and you simply have a controller that um, can control these games and uh, the games are streamed to you with a very low latency. Uh, I worked on video streaming for years, both at Comcast and Microsoft. 
I'm extremely skeptical unless they have some kind of magic that uh, the video producers of the world don't have that the ISPs of the world don't have and that game developers don't have I don't see how this takes off simply because of the latency the streaming um, size and the other issues but hopefully that sort of answers your question to say 2D, yes, streaming with 2D, uh, probably not. All right, so it's 12, well, it's 12.20 my time. I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes, ask any more, answer any more questions, but I know that uh, you folks have to hit the road as well to get to your next event. Uh, thank you for having me. I am going to throw this on my blog um, probably tomorrow or so. I'll put it right here at the front page. It'll be a talk uh, along with all the resources that I had kind of covered uh, and the PowerPoints if you need that. And then finally, I'm a very easy individual to find. My name is Dave Voiles and I'm on everything, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, so very easy person to get in touch with. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to help. Thank you for having me. Anyone have any last minute personal questions or are we all?